very likely that this virus has come from bats. Bats have lots of viruses. Very few of these viruses actually make them sick. Bats are not a villain. Coronaviruses are a type of virus that can spread from animals to humans and cause diseases like SARS and MERS. The latest coronavirus outbreak started in Wuhan, China. So far, it's killed almost 1,400 people and infected more than 60,000 around the world. Scientists are racing to figure out how humans contracted the new virus. Based on initial genetic testing and past outbreaks, they say it's likely the coronavirus originated in bats. There was a recent paper put out where they looked at the sequence of a virus. They found that the closest relative to the Wuhan virus was a virus from a bat, 96% similar. I think that is pretty accepted that the viruses are very likely coming from bats, but how they're getting to us from bats, either directly or through some intermediate host, needs to be worked out though for this new one. There isn't one particular kind or species of bats that's associated with spillovers. For Nipah and Hendra, it's the big fruit bats. For SARS, and MERS, and this one, it's smaller insect-eating bats. Other animals have passed viruses between bats and humans before. SARS really spread from civet cats into humans. But now we know that the virus some point in time jumped from bats into civet cats. With MERS, what we think happened there is that a coronavirus jumped from bats into dromedary camels. And uh, recently we're seeing this virus jumping from dromedary camels into the human population. Now, Chinese scientists say pangolins could be the middlemen, but their research hasn't been made public yet. Pangolins are the most trafficked animal in the world. They're basically like an armadillo with plates. So they've got these really long scales, and those scales are prized in traditional Chinese medicine. I think the isolation of this virus from pangolins is going to cause a lot of stir because we're, there is going to be kind of a knee-jerk reaction to say, you know, pangolins are probably it. The more that people look at some of the genetic data, you'll get a little bit of infighting in the scientific community as to really whether or not the pangolin virus is the true direct link or if it's just maybe another piece of the puzzle. I think we should be really cautious until we see the paper that comes out. Scientists don't need to know where the virus came from in order to develop a vaccine. But identifying the origin can help contain the current outbreak and prevent future ones. After the SARS outbreak, the government banned the sale of civet cats. Because we have now determined that civet cats could lead to more coronavirus exposures. So something similar could happen if, with 100% confidence, we can identify that it was this animal. Early reports linked the first coronavirus patients to a market in Wuhan where bats might have been sold as food. New testing has raised doubts about the market's role in the outbreak, but xenophobia toward eating bats has still festered. If you cook meat, you're going to destroy viruses like coronaviruses because they're not very heat stable, but either handling the animals or handling the meat or preparing the meat would, would certainly put you at rest. Chickens give us salmonella all the time. Do we stop eating chickens? No. Just stigmatizing a traditional practice or someone's food doesn't help the cause. It's wrong. You gotta understand the science and explain it to them. Scientists do know that bats and rodents carry a relatively high number of viruses, but bats often don't get sick from them. If we can figure out why bats don't get sick, we may be able to apply it to reducing the effects of viral infection. If we don't have clear cut answers, we've got a lot of hypotheses. One is that bats are the only mammals that have evolved the ability to fly. Flying takes up an enormous output of energy. As a byproduct of all that metabolic activity, you generate toxic molecules. What bats have done is evolved to deal with that. Those properties, for whatever reason, allow them to deal with viruses as well. But all this is conjecture. We and other groups over the years have identified molecular mechanisms that bats have evolved that suppresses inflammation in bats. So bats have a good antiviral response that helps them control virus replication. And they have low levels of inflammation. Despite the animal's potential relationship to the new coronavirus, virologists don't want people to vilify bats, many of which are endangered. The reputation of bats is a, is a very high concern. 
bats are so essential for our ecosystems. For example, the bats that I study, the flying foxes, are major pollinators. We love bats. We use bats as a model to understand the superior immune responses they have as mammals. We want to learn from them and hopefully identify therapeutic targets for humans. The more we kind of blend humans and animals, the more we're going to see all of these new viruses that humans have never seen. It's not like it's just bats. It's possible that a kangaroo virus might emerge some point in time in the future. If anything, humans are the problem because we are encroaching on their domains. Okay, so if you're watching the news and all that, you have still no clue what actually happens when you get coronavirus because it's all interspersed with fear. Here's what happens if you get infected with coronavirus in the instance of the people who aren't that sick and the people who get really sick. So the people who aren't that sick, they may have a fever, they may have a cough, and it's often a dry cough, although sometimes there can be the production of snot and mucus and that kind of thing. And then some people have a little mild shortness of breath initially, but a lot of people don't. So it really feels like an early flu or a cold. You can have muscle aches, that kind of thing. And the majority of people in the series that they've looked at get better in one to two weeks. So the symptoms get better. Maybe they barely have any symptoms at all, but you know what? It's weird when they actually scan the lungs of these patients that are barely having symptoms, they actually have some abnormalities even then on their lung scans that they're really not feeling a lot of symptoms of. So it starts to make you think people are spreading this thing without a ton of symptoms. And they looked even at the cruise ship, people were testing positive, not having a lot of symptoms. So that's how this thing is probably spreading. and We don't even know it because we're not testing everybody around. Okay. So mild symptoms, not much going on. Well, what happens in the people who get really sick? And these tend to be older people. They tend to be people with other morbidities, meaning they have uh, lung disease or diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease or they have immunocompromised. And it doesn't, it's not always the case, but it seems that the older people are hit very hard by this and young kids are particularly spared by it. So in those older patients, what may happen is somewhere after the initial symptoms start, maybe even up to eight days on average after, you suddenly get worse. And the way that manifests is a lot of shortness of breath. Um, so people really feel like, oh, I'm having trouble breathing. And that's what often leads them to the presentation to the hospital. They end up in the hospital. And at that point, it's a rapid decompensation where if you do a scan, then the lungs show these very distinctive patterns of pneumonia. It's often on both sides of the lungs. It's often in the periphery of the lungs, on the outside part of the lungs. And it often leads to people, you know, up to 15% of the patients or higher uh, that show up to the hospital end up going to the ICU. You. And at that point, they need help with breathing, whether it's a high pressure mask, a lot of oxygen, or an actual breathing tube placed in the lung. Now, why? The reason is the pneumonia, which is a kind of an inflammation caused by the infection and the immune response to the infection of the lungs, causes a barrier between the ability to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide and your blood and the air. And so as a result, people feel like they can't breathe. Their blood oxygen levels drop. They may have a white blood cell count that's either too low or too high, and their liver function tests are a little abnormal. Those are some of the lab tests you see, but really you see they're just having trouble breathing, right? And oxygenating, exchanging gas. So at that point, you may have to put in uh, a ventilatory assistance tube, an endotracheal tube. Now, what we see then is in patients who get really sick, they develop something called, and this is why this disease can be so fatal in people who it does affect that way, which by the way are again a minority of the patients that are infected. So all the fear mongering and everything you're hearing on the news, I mean, this can happen with influenza, guys, and it does. It does. All right? So. They get something called acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's when the lungs really take a hit. They get damaged, and if you take biopsies, you just see the little alveoli sacs that exchange air are just jacked up, for lack of a medical word, right? And in those settings, it takes a lot of assistance to ventilate those patients. It's often associated with other problems due to the immune reaction to the virus, and that includes sepsis, sometimes due to secondary infections that happen. So because your lungs are all gummed up and you're on a ventilator and it's moist and it's a perfect environment for bacteria and other viruses, you can often get a secondary infection like a pneumonia and those sort of things, and that can cause things to get even worse. At that point, if you have sepsis, you can get multi-organ failure, your blood pressure can plummet, you can go into shock, you can have 
have trouble ventilating, you may need the assistance of dialysis for your kidneys or ECMO, which is like kind of external oxygenation device, like a bypass machine. And when it gets that serious, your chances of dying are very, very high. If you actually survive that, your chances of having some permanent disability in your lungs due to scarring or other responses from the inflammation are not very low either. And this happened with SARS as well. So we're seeing this pattern with these family of coronaviruses. So this is how people tend to get sick. So the bottom line is, if you're having mild symptoms, fever, cough, you're not having a lot of shortness of breath, you don't need necessarily to show up at the doctor, right? You can call and we can talk about that in a separate video. But the people who get very sick, those warning signs are real shortness of breath, dizziness, lightheadedness, changes in your mental status and your ability to think, inability to keep food down, those are signs that you really need to seek emergency uh, care. So I hope this was helpful. Share this video, become a supporter if you want to support more videos like this and stay safe out there. We're out. Fragile and frightened, on camp beds placed one meter apart, tents and shelters are now being used as hospital wards in northern Italy. Some patients have emergency space blankets placed over them to help with chills. The stream of sick people is constant. Some come via ambulance, others walk in and are guided to a checkpoint for tests. <coughs> Equipment is running out and the staff haven't rested in weeks. The main problem is a patient coming in afraid. They find themselves in a tent and not a traditional hospital building, which doesn't reassure them. If they're diagnosed with the virus, we have to calm them down and explain what will happen. As Italy tracks its losses, with more than 1,200 now dead, the rest of Europe watches on in horror, wondering how many weeks or days before their countries look like this too outside the makeshift hospital ward amid the fear. A homemade banner proclaims it will be okay. The World Health Organization says the trajectory of this virus in each country depends on how it's reacting. In Spain, a state of emergency has been declared for the next 15 days. Police locked down over 70,000 people in towns close to Barcelona. While in the south of the country, emergency vehicles were on the roads, announcing people should stay at home because stopping coronavirus is everyone's responsibility. Britain is an outlier, currently choosing not to take the extreme lockdown measures seen elsewhere on the continent. Europe may currently be the epicenter, but leaders in the Americas have been exposed too. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in self-isolation after his wife tested positive following a visit to London. He held a press conference keeping a safe distance from reporters. I am in isolation as are my, uh, my children and my wife is in quarantine. Canada's parliament has also been suspended. I'm 64 years old. If you take care of yourself, in a o teste de positivo, né? Se der positivo, o presidente vai ter que despachar daqui, a gente vai recomendar o isolamento domiciliar. Brazil's president Bolsonaro appeared in this Facebook broadcast with the country's health minister to reassure Brazilians after being tested himself. There are now reports it was positive, but he has denied them, claiming his results were negative and that people shouldn't believe the fake news media. Bolsonaro's communications secretary, seen here on the right, does have coronavirus, and another world leader has been potentially infected by him. On Saturday, he posed with President Trump. President of Brazil, is a fantastic job. And while the White House says the pair had almost no interactions, the photos and video on his Instagram suggest otherwise. Mr. Trump was also filmed shaking hands with Mr. Bolsonaro. Countries around the world are now imposing extreme measures. After the Philippines announced a local travel ban will come into force this Sunday, it was a scramble to get out of Manila. Even with a nationwide lockdown in place, Italy still struggles. Today there was a 25% spike in the death toll, the largest rise yet. <laughs> A 
Amid the agony, Italians try to keep their spirits up. Videos of neighbours singing the same song from inside their homes are now going viral. Italy has taken aggressive measures. Will Britain follow suit or remain reluctant? Well, stock markets have rebounded slightly today after London and New York experienced their biggest one-day decline since 1987 yesterday. Central banks have announced measures to ease pressures on businesses, but many are still warning of the dire impact of the coronavirus. Our business and global trade correspondent Paul McNamara joins me now. Paul, how bad is it? Well, let's start at least with a glimmer of good news. Today was a slightly better day than it was yesterday. Part of that is because yesterday was so bad, like the last worst in 30 odd years, there's going to be a little bit of a rebound. So the Dow Jones today, a short while ago, that was up 3.5%. Uh, Part of the rebound was also because investors started hearing the things that they want to hear. So the German finance minister, for example, he said, we will offer unlimited credit to struggling firms. They're talking about 500 billion pounds worth of government loans that they're going to give out. The EU have said similar, but the EU's chief economist then went on to say um, across the Eurozone, he expects to see zero growth or negative growth. Negative growth to you and me, that's a recession. Um, so look, across, across the EU, um, stocks were up at about 1%. Here, the FTSE closed up 2.5%. Don't get too happy about that 2.5%, though. Look at this. So uh, we're about to see, this is how the FTSE's been doing for the last while, all going great guns, and then that's about a month ago. In that month, that drop, that there, is 30% of the value of the FTSE being wiped off. That's huge. Uh, that sounds very alarming. What does it actually mean to people? Well, yeah, you might regret asking that, actually. So if, if you're sitting at home right now and you've got a pension right now, it's worth a heck of a lot less than it was a month ago. But look, Pensions in the long run, they will go up, and up, up again. More worrying, we are now looking at a case of job losses. Lots of them, and at big firms, not just at small places that aren't, ready to, aren't able to weather the storm. It's a point in case, British Airways. Today, their chief executive messaged the message staff, and the language is about as strong as it gets from a chief executive. Alex Cruz said, to be frank, given the changing circumstances, we can no longer sustain our current level of employment and jobs will be lost, perhaps for a short period, perhaps longer term. We are suspending routes and we'll be parking aircraft in a way we have never had to before. Please do not, understand, please do not underestimate the seriousness of this for our company. At one point he was saying it was worse than 9-11. And it's not just them. Edinburgh Airport today said they're preparing for a scenario where they could be no flights, for three months. 7,000 people work there. And what about other areas of the economy? Well, yesterday I spoke to one analyst and he said, we're now at the, we're now at the point of, of, of no return. So the economy has slowed down so much that even if coronavirus went away tomorrow, damage has already been done and jobs will be lost. Have a look at this. This is uh, from a firm called Wireless Social. There's a lot of fancy technology to measure footfall of people going in and out of bars, pubs, clubs, restaurants. And this is year-on-year -year change. So at the start there, down 6%. That is three weeks ago, 6% decline of people going into bars, pubs, clubs, restaurants. That figure there is last night. That is down 20%. What does that mean? I spoke to one analyst who said, this is unsustainable. The only surprise he's seen is that we haven't had actual closures or job losses yet. Paul, cool, thanks very much for joining us, I think. <laughs> yeah. Apologies. I'm not sure thanks is the right word. Kathy. Well, earlier, the WHO raised the temperature. This is what they said today. Europe has now become the epicenter of the pandemic, with more reported cases and deaths than the rest of the world combined, apart from China. More cases are now being reported every day than were reported in China at the highest of its epidemic. Well, a short while ago, I spoke to Dr. Bruce Aylward, Assistant Director at the World Health Organization, and I began by asking him if he was concerned that the UK government appeared to be holding back from containing the coronavirus now that Europe is the epicenter of the outbreak. 
Um, well, I don't know all of the specifics of what's being done in, in, in the United Kingdom, but what I can talk about is is what does work. And, uh, you know, the, the experience I have come ma comes mainly from China and a few other countries that I've worked with over the last while. And their, their success in minimizing the amount of damage that this disease uh, caused was, uh, whether economic or in terms of lives, was through um, broad testing. And when I say broad, I mean anyone who was a suspected case got tested in these countries. They rapidly identified who was a case. They tried to effectively um, isolate those cases, uh, whether in a hospital uh, mo most frequently, and then to quarantine their closest contacts. And that was the way that they slowed this down in China. And people often point to China and say, look, they managed to slow this down. I think what we've got to be very careful of is that we don't cherry pick uh, bits and pieces of what China did, but really apply the rigor that they did in many different provinces to control this thing. Is it therefore surprising that the UK is not going to be testing people in their own homes anymore who have suspected cases? They're only going to test people who end up in hospital. What do you make of that? Well, here, I think we've, we've got to be a little bit careful because we know what worked in one place in China. We know that Korea are doing a lot of testing and they're bringing the numbers down because they can find the disease. But I, I think we've got to be very careful when we say we know exactly what works and what doesn't. Um, you've got some very clever people making the decisions around how to run the UK uh, uh, program. And I, I think what the important thing is, is we move forward with a policy we try it, and if it's not working, we'd be ready to adapt, adjust, um, and, and, and uh, as needed to, to try and bring down the intensity of transmission. So there's no right or wrong uh, uh, right now with the disease that we've known for only 12 weeks. Um, the key thing is to throw everything you can at slowing it down because we know that this can uh, cause tremendous damage. So can you understand why the government isn't advising cancelling sporting events and actually those organizations have sort of taken it into their own taken matters into their own hands i anticipate what they're doing is looking at their transmission characteristics the nature of the cases how they're clustering which i haven't seen the specifics of and they're saying we don't believe those would be major drivers of it so they're trying to make an evidence-based decision on what uh, drives the transmission in a place like the uk and base their policy on that that is quite a gamble, though, isn't it? And I mean, people can't escape the idea that perhaps we're kind of human guinea pigs in all of this because we know so little about how to combat this virus. We're all guinea pigs, um, uh, Kathy, unfortunately, uh, because it, it is a new virus. And to say that anyone knows exactly how to do this um, would, would be, uh, would, would be um, hubris at this point. You've placed a lot of emphasis on the importance of testing and how other countries have managed to slow the spread through um, lots of tests. Um, we're reporting tonight on a new rapid testing kit which will be available in about a week mm. which will produce test results in 10 minutes. How much of a breakthrough do you think that kind of testing will offer here? Oh, that'd be fantastic. It's a test that tells them whether or not they've been infected in particular or they're currently infected. Then remember, that's going to make it so much easier for people to know um, I'm a risk or not and to take that much more seriously the fact that they have to isolate. Because when we're working um, in, in China, for example, and in other countries, um, sometimes testing just fell way behind the caseload because the cases got ahead of uh, the, the PCR testing. So if, um, if they've... Uh, Crack the nut on that. That 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 could facilitate um, um, the whole response. Anything that cuts hours, cuts minutes, cuts days out of um, the time taken for someone who is feeling unwell to know whether or not they have the disease is um, a huge gain in terms of taking the heat out of this uh, out of this um, um, uh, outbreak, slowing it down, and saving lives. A lot of people in this country have seen the pictures coming out of Italian hospitals. They're now seeing Spain declare a state of emergency, can the UK avoid the fate of Italy and Spain or really are we bracing for a really very serious public health crisis here as the Prime Minister said yesterday? Well, what, what I always like to, to go back to, and I sound a little like a broken record, but um, is the experience that I saw in China, where they had a couple of, um, well, one province in particular out of 31 that was hit horribly by this disease. 
Um, but the other provinces then realized, okay, if we can rapidly identify may, who may be uh, unwell by, by their symptoms, the test ideally, but, but, but also by symptoms, if you can get those people to isolate and break down the transmission of this thing, then you will take the heat out of it and you will not necessarily see the fate of uh, you know, some of the big places where this is really blown up. And I think the other thing we have to remember, uh, uh, Kathy, is we don't fully understand this virus. Why does it blow up in some places very quickly like it has and not in others? Um, there's lots of speculation, but the reality is this is a biologic process. And, um, you know, embers, you know, fly off this particular fire into different places. And sometimes they blow up fast. Sometimes they smolder and blow up. Um, we're still learning that part. So it's never inevitable. Um, the key thing is to move fast to try and identify where that virus is and then make sure that those people isolate themselves. Are you concerned that as China starts up again, just eight new cases today, but as its economy starts up again, people start getting back to normal, that there will be a resurgence of this outbreak there? Yeah, it's not that, that, not that I'm concerned, Kathy. It's the... Um, whole government of, of China, the people of China are concerned about this. And as a result, they've been very careful in preparing for the restart of uh, bolstering of their, their economy, getting their society moving, getting their business moving, getting their schools uh, going full board again. What they were doing to prepare for that, they said, we're buying ventilators and we're building isolation beds because we think there could be a resurgence. The virus is still around. It hasn't disappeared completely. But we do not have to close our schools, our economy, et cetera, a second time. We want to build the capacity to manage this disease if we have to while we live with it. So China is taking it very, very seriously. They are not hoping it's disappeared for good. They're preparing to continue to do uh, battle with this virus if they have to. I mean, you talked about how China is preparing for a potential resurgence in terms of um, ventilators. Um, we've surveyed 1,000 NHS staff for our program tonight. 99% say that they don't feel that the NHS is in a good position to face rapidly increasing numbers. Are they right to be concerned? The world is not ready. This is not about the UK. This is not about the NHS. This is about the world isn't ready for this disease. We have not got the ventilators necessarily. We have not got the beds. And that's the reason we have got to find the virus, try and take the heat out of it so that we don't have to use every single bed and every single ventilator that we have. Bruce Aylward, thanks very much. Well, let's have a quick update on which countries have today announced that they are curtailing people's movements. The Netherlands, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Malta, Ukraine, Turkey, Pakistan and Hong Kong have announced travel restrictions and quarantine measures. And at least four South American countries have, just like in the US, now banned flights from Europe. Well, in Iran, the authorities have warned people they have 24 hours to get off the streets or the army will force them home. Roads, shops and communal areas are to be emptied as the nation's death toll continues to soar and the Iranian regime finally shows signs of acknowledging the seriousness of the outbreak. And as our international editor Lindsay Hilson reports, doctors have been trying to raise the alarm there for weeks. In Tehran, they're preparing for Nowruz, Persian New Year, in the traditional way. And only now, more than three weeks after coronavirus hit, has the government told people not to travel on holiday, to close shops and get off the streets. I beg the people to minimize their trips and contacts and to isolate those who are infected. The last time we saw the deputy health minister was on February the 25th, since which time he appears to have recovered from the coronavirus, unlike many of his compatriots. Earlier this week, the body of a senior doctor was borne away in an ambulance, another victim of coronavirus, mourned by the staff at his hospital in Gilan province. A few days earlier, Dr. Vahid Monsef had been recorded on the phone expressing his desperation.
The Beheshte Masume Cemetery in Qom has at least 100 fresh graves. The government says another 85 people died overnight countrywide, but many Iranians believe the real number is far higher. A well-known Iranian actress filmed her conversation with a friend in hospital. She doesn't seem to be too badly affected, but there's a shortage of respirators to deal with more serious cases. Many Iranians are furious that Mahan Air, a private airline used by the Revolutionary Guard, was flying to and from China even yesterday, according to Flight Radar 24. Another doctor in a different province was recorded venting his fury to the local governor. We've revoiced him in English to disguise his identity. Why should I have to wake up to find a patient I've been treating for four or five days is dead? You only hear about it. You don't see their face, but it's right before my eyes. We're tired of all these shortcomings and the saving face. The person mustn't find out. It will look bad. And for so-and-so not to be upset and for so-and-so not to be offended. To save face in front of whatever country. Next door in the Iraqi city of Basra, volunteers are disinfecting the streets. The WHO says travelers from Iran, mainly pilgrims, brought the virus not just to Iraq, but to 14 other countries too. The Iranian government has woken up late to the damage wreaked by their cover-up and failure to act. Lindsay Hilson there. The Education Secretary has defended the decision to keep the UK schools and colleges open. The policy is in direct contrast with closures across Europe. Addressing school leaders today, Gavin Williamson insisted it was the best course of action. But was the advice enough to reassure headteachers? Our home affairs correspondent, Darshna Soni, has been finding out. I just wish that we could be meeting under better circumstances. And what circumstances they were to be delivering his first speech as Education Secretary to the School Leaders Union. In the overwhelming majority of situations, there is absolutely no need to close a school or to send pupils or staff home. Over a thousand delegates tightly packed into an enclosed space, a type of gathering that may soon be banned. Among those listening, head teacher Diane Anderson and her colleagues, who admitted they had been a little anxious about attending. I do have to admit it was a little bit concerning, but we've listened to the advice that's been given and tried to take a measured decision about it. And just lots of hand gel, hand washing? Yes, definitely so. Dominating the conference talk, the government's insistence that schools should stay open. Do you feel confident in the strategy? I think this is new for us. This is something that yeah. we haven't experienced before. Um, so feeling reassured, no, not at the moment. I think the issue is when you're hearing that all the other schools are closing in Ireland, all around, what is happening here? You know, what, what are we going to be doing? On why aren't we closing why here? Why aren't we closing? And I had a call from a parent, you know, really worried. You know, miss, um, aren't you closing the school? I really don't want my child to be catching anything. The government has denied that it's out of step with other countries in Europe, including Spain, Italy and Ireland, who have decided to shut their schools. It insists that it's following scientific advice, but are there other practical considerations behind the decision? It's telling that in his speech here, the Education Secretary said that sending pupils home would put strain on key workers, including nurses, who would have to stay at home to look after them. It's a completely different story here in Spain. It's empty classrooms along with Italy, France and Denmark, illustrating the stark difference with the UK's approach. And in Ireland, nurseries, schools and universities have also all been closed. But over the border in Northern Ireland, they remain open, a decision criticised as confusing. Now is the time to ensure that all schools are closed, that universities and colleges are closed, and that needs to happen immediately. 
I think the fact that there has been contradictory medical evidence out there is a problem. It's a problem for people whenever they're trying to make the right decisions for them and their families. In England, despite the government's advice, a growing number of universities have told students not to turn up to lectures next week. Although campuses will remain open, they'll be switching to online learning and exams. At the school leaders' conference, many felt that the closures will inevitably come. There are concerns about the timing. The exam season starts in May, just before the time scientists predict the virus will peak. I think what teachers will be doing is reassuring young people that the regulator, Ofqual, working with the exam boards, have got contingency plans for precisely that. And it's not as if this will be the first time that schools have ever had to close during exam season or that students haven't been able to sit a particular paper. That has happened and does happen. It's just not happened on the scale we might be facing. The government has said it will keep its decision under constant review and it's cautioned those calling for closures. Its scientists have advised that if they're to be effective, the closures would have to be at least 13 weeks long. Darsh Nasani, Channel 4 News, Birmingham.